So we asked Mark to come and talk about the Wisconsin experience, but also Mark uh, spends a lot of time in uh, invasive species in, in general. Um, and so kind of try to relate it to that. And without further ado, I'll get you loaded up here. And Great. Thanks, Tony. And it's uh, great to be here. Um, I'm going to kind of give you an update of what Palmer Amaranth has been doing in Wisconsin. And this is kind of a collaboration from several of the weed scientists at, uh, at the university. Um, I'll kind of answer some key questions that Jeff wanted to answer and is kind of in tune with a lot of the, the previous presentations uh, as well. So just kind of jump into the chase. How much do we know that we have? And I want to emphasize that this is probably underrepresented. Um, we found our first population in 2011, and I'll discuss the details where, and we've had a pretty steady increase in observations, but to date, we only know of 15 populations spanning nine counties. Now, if you're really good at looking at this, you'll, you'll point out that there's not 15 dots on our map, and an important point is some individuals did not share the GPS locations with us. We only know the location at a county level, too. And that's an important point coming up as well. Some of these observations, uh, two of them in particular, came from the Illinois Plant Clinic, which many of you may know do have the ability to test for various amaranthus species at one time. They would t differentiate Palmer uh, if you, and do the herbicide testing. Now they're only uh, doing it for amaranthus species. You have to ask for that difference. So we are seeing an increase, but I want to put it in perspective, similar to Minnesota, it's much less compared to our water hemp uh, expansion, which has been rapidly um, expanding. 200 populations in 2010. We have now have well documented over 400 populations, and again, heavily underreported. So we put it in perspective, but we kind of, I think, have set the stage. People are really concerned and talking a lot about water hemp, and as you'll see, they're getting barraged in the media about Palmer, and so they're thinking about it a little bit more. They're going, Water hemp's really a challenge for us now. If we get this other species, it could be a problem. So how did Palmer arrive in these areas? This is really the challenge. We've been trying to come up with some answers. Uh, one of the, the first location was actually one of our county farms where we do research. So I have no idea how it showed up, but we discovered it in 2011. Probably the, the biggest population was we had a corn seed production company discovered it in 2014 in one of their fields. Uh, it was believed to have been brought in on some equipment that they purchased from out of state. Very common and logical mechanism or pathway. But here's the problem is it came in and they spread it to a bunch of adjacent fields in other counties by that same equipment and mechanism. So that's a real common. We'll have one source or point of entry and then spreading it throughout the state uh, in that mechanism. And that's uh, a challenge. We do have reports of two areas where there are fairly large dairy operations. We don't know any of the details of these, um, how this came there, but we get a lot of reports about cottonseed. Again, we are the dairy state. Cottonseed is a very important supplement that they feed to the dairy. And um, we have, have had lots of discussions about that. A lot of that cotton is coming, seed is coming from states where Palmer is uh, heavily infested in the south, and so that is something we wonder if that may be an issue as well. And then eight of those, we just have no data on how it came in or didn't come in too. So again, kind of similar to your case, different pathways are likely to be causing, uh, causing the spread, and some of those aren't known. The big concern is herbicide resistance, and so there has been several, t several um, of these populations have been tested for herbicide resistant. Some have been shown to be susceptible to all the herbicides that have been tested for. We do have two populations, however, that have been shown to be resistant to glyphosate. Uh, we have a third population that's been shown to be sensitive to glyphosate, but tolerant to two other herbicides, HPPD and ALS inhibitors. But again, many of these have not been tested um, for various reasons, which we can get into in the discussion. So um, unclear on some of the resistance on some of those. There, there appears to be a mixture of resistance and susceptible populations that are present. So what we've been doing is we've been working with our Department of Agriculture to, to do some random surveys. It sounds like you guys started this in 2018. We've actually been doing this since 2016. 
uh, our Department of Ag actually volunteered to do this, and it's been really successful. Where we, we've been piggybacking on some of their other insect surveys. Probably some people in the audience know what insects they're scouting that I don't recall. But uh, this has been really popular because we get anywhere from 350 to 500 fields that they survey in a year, and they're doing a late season scouting where it's relatively easy for them to identify water hemp and palmer amaranth. So pro well over 1,000 fields have been monitored uh, throughout this three years of sampling, and we have yet to discover a positive sample of palmer amaranth from this mechanism, similar to your results as well. I know our ag economists say we have tens of thousands of ag fields, so our power is pretty limited, even though we're getting over 1,000 fields over a three-year time frame. What's interesting, though, is we are picking up water hemp in all those around a 5% uh, of the fields. We're seeing a presence uh, in there as well. Uh, interestingly, not an increase over time. We actually have data from 2012, 2013 that shows that in the state, on average, we get around 5%. But what we're seeing is in areas of the state that it was not present. Now we're starting to get an expansion into other areas, too. So, but that's a whole other story as well. I did come across this to point out that there are models that have been developed to predict suitable habitat, and much of Wisconsin and Minnesota are deemed suitable habitat. So um, we are, according at least to this research that came out in, I believe, April, much of our state is deemed suitable habitat, and I guess some of your area where you found it is not deemed suitable habitat, so this might not be the best model. Uh, as well. So that clearly we're expecting to have increased expansion uh, in the future. I think one of, the, one of the differences that we see in Wisconsin is uh, we have not seen any palmer amaranth in any situation but an agricultural situation of annual row crops. Uh, we have not observed it or been contacted about even visiting any fields where uh, there has been a conservation planting. We have had some meetings with our NRCS and FSA, and they have been uh, sending out fact sheets uh, and recommending that uh, the seed that's purchased as part of this is, I believe they have in their recommendations that they, they highly recommend, or there needs to be a justification if it's not Wisconsin bought seeds. So they have some capabilities of limiting its establishment, and they have good recommendations in BMPs on seeding methods, timings, and management, which really should deal with the issue. I'm sure that the case is in Minnesota as well as here is we know unfortunately those BMPs are often not followed and that's our concern. They are in place, there's contracts where they're required to follow them, many times there's not not followed and that's where our concern is for, for Palmer showing up in these conservation plantings. So um, I already talked about that. So how do we regulate Palmer in Wisconsin? Um, we're a little bit different than Minnesota as we have an invasive plant rule, which, which an invasive species rule, which is by our Department of Natural Resources. And how that works is, is that every time that rule is reassessed, they assess and put more species onto the list, similar process that happens here in Minnesota, but is, is, is done by the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources uh, they considered assessing Palmer amaranth in the last round, but decided not to. But we're just in the process of reassessing this issue in 2019 right now. And it is, well, I'm going to make sure that it will be assessed in 2019. So there is a good chance that it could be added to our invasive species rule in 2019 that is, uh, mandate, that is managed by our Department of Natural Resources. What our Department of Agriculture did, which was uh, really good, is they did add it to the seed labeling and sale rule, or Wisconsin DAT cap, uh, ATCP 20, added Palmer and water hemp to that rule recently, just this past summer. So that's on the books, and that's, uh, that's a big positive. So we have really not done a lot of active regulation throughout this, but we've been really doing a lot of education and trying to improve detection of this issue. Uh, really started ramping things up in 2016 where we created lots of resources. The videos have been mentioned. We have fact sheets, bookmarks, newsletter articles. And I think what might be a little bit different than what's been happening here is we've really um, looked at two different types of audiences. 
We've worked really closely with our agricultural stakeholders, our crop consultants, farmers, and people that work in that industry and really targeted a lot of information to them. Similar to Minnesota Extension, we have good long-standing relationships, so it's easy for us to get this information, and they're motivated to be involved. What we also did, though, too, is we have a first detectors network like Minnesota did, which has a lot of citizen scientists. We've also pushed a lot of information out to them just to make them aware of this issue, because believe it or not, they're hearing about these super weeds and there's a lot of interest. And so that's been a benefit. And if you would have seen in some of those slides, we've had some uptick since 2016 in reports. It's because of this active reporting that we've, uh, that we've done and how we've, we've approached it. So how have people responded? I kind of separated, unlike um, Jeff, I separated out into the ag business side and then the farmers, because I think we have two different responses. Our ag business stakeholders and our crop consultants have been great. They've been actively looking. They want this information. They're the ones that have been giving us the information in the reports. That's where we've been finding these presents, is from either ag business people or crop consultants. They're motivated for various reasons. Ag business is motivated, to be honest. It's an opportunity for them to sell some more of their products. And these crop consultants are motivated because they know if they don't get this under control, it's, it's going to really make them look bad, too. So the ag business side is very active and very interested in being involved. I would kind of um, say, in Wisconsin at least, the producers are a little bit of a mixed bag, though. To date, we have not gotten a report from a individual producer, and we definitely have ones that have looked for it. In talking with them, they are getting the message that Palmer is bad. They're getting barraged by the public ag newspapers and these other medias about how bad Palmer is in other states. You need to look out for it. Uh, but they're really concerned about their image. What was that you said, Jeff, is like they don't want to be the guy. Exactly. In Wisconsin, in particular, being the dairy state, our big, one of the biggest concerns we hear is there's a lot of concern about where they can spread their manure. And there's been discussions, if they find Palmer on their property, their neighbors aren't going to let them spread manure on other adjacent prop properties. And it's going to be a huge issue, a game changer. And I think that's a big concern. That, that concern is why we're not getting more reports from some of those individual uh, farmers. And um, where we have been getting some help is when they're working in conjunction with the local county agent or some local county individual where there's some support there. But there's a lot of concern how they're going to be, uh, how it's going to be interpreted. And so I feel very strongly that there are reports out there that we're not getting because of this concern. And I think the, the manure spreading is one real prime example. Uh, Jeff and others wanted me to ask about how we've been tracking and reporting this. Uh, we ha do work very closely with EDMAPS and the Great Lakes Early Detection Network, uh, very similar to many agencies in Minnesota do. And so we're, we do have Palmer Amaranth in there, and we're asking people to use this app to report that. Um, we are getting a few individuals, our county agent and staff, to use that, but most of our reports are coming where they're sending us images in an email and they're giving us the GPS coordinates. Uh, and some of the time, they don't even give us a GPS coordinates. They just tell us the nearest city and where they're at, too. So we're trying to put all our information into EdMaps. Why we like EdMaps is it's a national database. And if they don't want to share that location, it has the ability to keep that location private. So we've been trying to do that. But in some instances, they just don't give us those. So we also have a separate spreadsheet that we're uh, recording them so we can create those maps at the, at the county scale, which it looks like many of you guys are doing uh, as well. So I kind of uh, figured that you guys wanted my opinion, or at least Jeff indicated, so maybe Jeff wants my opinion and no one else does. So I would kind of sum things up and give some of my opinions. Uh, Palmer Amaranth is spreading throughout Wisconsin. It's going to continue to spread. I very strongly feel that way. The rate is what's really the question. You know, there's really not a lot of research on how much more competitive it's going to be. We know in Illinois, water hemp was everywhere, and Palmer is displacing where water hemp is. Very well documented in Illinois. We don't know if that's going to happen in Wisconsin. And I think in Minnesota, my guess is you guys feel the same way. There's, there's some research that's just on, started right now in Wisconsin that hopefully will answer some of those questions. As far as the habitats of where it's going to spread to, we've only seen it in 
in, in uh, agricultural lands, it's only been annual agricultural lands. Other states, Michigan has seen it in perennial agricultural lands like, like alfalfa. So that would be our expectation. We're seeing water hemp move in to establish alfalfa fields. So that would be our expectation as the next hurdle. But uh, we still have not seen that to date. As far as its pathways, it's, our observations are pretty limited, but they suggest that you know, there's multiple pathways. In our instances, we feel very strongly that it's often equipment or inputs that are infested that are coming in, and those are leading to those uh, main pathways. But again, that's a very hard to prove uh, from those. We do have some examples from equipment and some anecdotal examples that makes us feel that feed has, is coming in that's infested as well. And will it take over agricultural fields and become our pr next primary weed? This is really an unknown. I mean, we definitely see it happening in Iowa and Illinois. It lends us to believe that it's credible that, that it will happen. I'm not sure if I can officially say climate change is happening now that we have a good new governor, but I'm going to say that it looks like if climate change continues, it looks like it will have a footprint in Wisconsin to a certain degree. Will it become our prim next primary weed? Really, it's, it's unknown to date. And really, um, we really haven't taken, besides the seed law, we haven't taken any active steps to regulate this plant. And I think because of how our regulation is set up in Wisconsin, which is different uh, with Wisconsin DNR dealing with invasive species rule, I'm not very optimistic, even if we do list it as a prohibited species, that it will be heavily enforced. And it's simply because of the case of the fact that NR40 in Wisconsin is not heavily enforced to begin with. And when that enforcement comes, comes to place, since it's focused on invasive species and non-crop lands, it's our game wardens. Don't see a lot of game wardens present on ag lands to begin with. And I'll be frank, there isn't a very good relationship between Wisconsin DNR and our ag producers. And so there's going to be some conflict there. So I think in your case, having better relationships with your department of ag um, is maybe a benefit where if you were to impose some type of regulation, that may be something um, that would be a benefit. I think kind of in closing, what I just want to say is that I think if we really wanted to, we could stop or slow this, the spread of these species. Um, but it's going to be a challenge. Our ag industry has made it very clear to us that they don't like rules that require them to do things. And I'll give uh, some examples uh, in a second, too. So they like these rules where it's voluntary. And that's really going to struggle to spread. To, that's really going to make it difficult for us to slow or stop the spread. And I think the greatest example is this cottonseed. Cottonseed comes in by the truckloads, right? It's clearly, we feel very strongly this is one of the major pathways in Wisconsin. So we actually went to our dairy science colleagues, our dairy nutritionists, and started to have this conversation about what can we do? This is an issue. Can we be proactive about this? It was made crystal clear to us that there should be no restrictions on cottonseed importation into Wisconsin. No interest on their part of even having that conversation. Cottonseed is very important for milk production. You know, we're not interested in having any discussions about how that would limit its introduction into the state. So that's a big challenge, right? That's a big, big challenge. And we are the dairy state. And I think that's an example. We could talk about other feed inputs uh, and have the same conversation. I think that cotton seed is really uh, the best example. Another great example is we have several farms that operate across state borders. Those state borders have heavily infested areas. They're moving equipment throughout the season. We feel very strongly that movement of equipment is what's leading this, this spread and this further movement. We could regulate that. There's mechanisms to do that, but I think we would create a lot of unhappy clientele if we mandated that. And so that's really the challenges that we're faced with Palmer or any weed that's in an agricultural system. Really, it becomes a challenge. We're really good at moving things around in agriculture. We spent decades perfecting, I wouldn't say perfecting, but coming pretty close to perfecting this process. And it's really a challenge to, to slow this process down when we're bringing in something that's undesirable like that as well, too. So I think that was where all the key points I wanted to make. If I have a, some time to answer some questions, I'd love to, or Absolutely. we can go to break. Anybody have questions they want to ask of Mark? 
All right, and we're all.